Welcome back to Beyond the Deform. I'm Justin Siri here with another virtual cup of coffee with top veterans in the civilian workforce. Today is episode number 290 with Preston Pish. And to be honest with you, whenever I was first starting out, there was some very, very early mornings, like 4 a.m., 3 a.m. kind of mornings. And I mean for years. And so if a person was kind of sitting next to you, kind of watching some of that, um, they would they would not be impressed at all. They'd be like, you know, that person needs to have their head examined. And so <laughs> there, there was a lot of hard work that went into it. But, it. but the thing for me was it was consistent work and it was persistent work. So um, it was just something that you just keep biting at, you know, how do you eat an elephant? You eat it one bite at a time. And for me, it's been, it's been a decade long journey of just kind of biting away at, at the elephant. And, but I've been doing it very persistently. It was such an honor to connect with Preston, who runs the number one investing podcast, We Study Billionaires, which has over 1 million downloads per month. In addition to that, he is ranked on Amazon in the top 35 business authors section. Both of these are impressive enough on their own, but what really kicks us to the next level is the fact that Preston does all of this while serving on active duty in the military, as well as being a present parent of four kids. First of all, my apologies to both Preston and listeners because I had some technical difficulties with this interview. Fortunately, Preston is always prepared and he had a backup recording of our interview as my recording software crashed for the first time in 280 episodes during Preston's interview. However, that recording did not have my audio, so I had to re-record this. So bear with me if the audio quality of today's episode is not as good as usual, but I assure you the content is absolutely top-notch. Preston is humble, he is authentic in his advice, and I believe regardless of your intended career path, you will benefit from listening to this episode. As always, at beyondtheuniform.org, you will find show notes with links to everything we discuss, as well as a link to the Investor Podcast and We Study Billionaires, Preston's site. Um, Highly recommend that you check those out. Special thanks to Tara Williams, who back in 2016 wrote on Apple Podcasts, What a Great Podcast. Um, There is such a need. As one who knows those who have struggled as a veteran, this is a great resource. Thank you, Tara, and all of you who have left positive reviews on Apple Podcasts. So with that, let's dive in to my conversation with Preston. Joining me today in Madison, Alabama, my guest is Preston Pish. I want to give listeners a very brief bio on him. Preston is the founder of the Pylon Holding Company, which conservatively grows equity through the acquisition of private or public companies. He runs the number one investing podcast called The Investor's Podcast, or We Study Billionaires, with over 1 million downloads per month. He is a best-selling author and ranked by Amazon in the top 35 business authors. He started out at West Point, currently serves in the U.S. Army, and holds an MBA from the Johns Hopkins University and a Master of Computer and Information Technology from the University of Pennsylvania. So Preston, to start things off, if you were to bump into someone who's currently serving on active duty just randomly on the street, and they asked you, Preston, what do you do for a living? How do you answer that? I don't. (laughs) Um, Hey, I want to correct one thing on my bio, and and it's so... I've recently applied to the UPenn program. I am not a graduate yet. And to be quite honest with you, um, I don't know if I'm going to have time to finish the program. <laughs> so uh, I appreciate the props there on the on calling it out, but I can't take credit for being a graduate there. But, you know, to answer your question, it's it's less for me about, you know, whatever I've built in the past or whatever I'm doing, it's just, I'm, I'm doing things that I thoroughly enjoy. And, um, for me that involves finance. I really enjoy talking about finance and I really enjoy engineering and math. And I guess I'm just a big hardcore nerd at, at the heart of it. So wherever that kind of leads me is, is really kind of my, my bio. (laughs) That's awesome. It makes me think of a video. So for listeners, if you go to the show notes for this episode at beyondtheuniform.org, you'll find a link to Preston's YouTube channel, which has 
Let's see here, uh, 130,000 subscribers. The video that's pinned at the top is called How Billionaires, How Billionaires Think. And he goes through, it's a really well-produced video, he goes through some commonalities that he's seen in studying so many billionaires. And the very first one is that they align their natural skills with their interests. And so Preston, it just kind of strikes me that you're following, I don't know uh, if it's intentional or not, you're following this example where you've got these different interests and you found a way to align your interests with uh, what you do with your natural interests and skills. Well, you know, it's it, it was a lot of luck for me, especially with the podcast and uh, the websites and stuff like that. I did it more just because it was something that I had an interest in and I was kind of doing it more for myself to educate myself. And it just so happened that there was people out there that, that liked to listen to it and, you know, the, the listeners kind of grew and it, it happened much more by luck and chance than anything that I can say was strategically planned. It was just more something I was doing because I was having fun, you know? That's awesome. And so was this something you started on active duty or is this something once you got out of the military that you started to focus on? Well, so this is the thing that's, that's a lot of people, most people, most people don't know about me. I still actively serve in the military and um, I kind of do two things at once. I do this kind of in the evening. Um, For me, I love serving and I love uh, what I do. So I do acquisition work for the for the government, a lot of business work. And, um, you know, in the evenings, whenever a lot of people sit down and they they close their eyes and they kind of stretch out their arms and they watch whatever show on Netflix at the end of the night, I kind of go into business mode and kind of hack away at my computer and um uh, have discussions and and do whatever and I've been doing it for a very long period of time and it's just been kind of my habit I guess that's just so insane so how do you do all this like how do you juggle all of these things simultaneously you know it's it there's a quote out there I think it's you know Bill Gates that is where I heard it from and he said a lot of people totally overestimate what they can do in one year but they way underestimate what they can do in 10 years. And I find so much truth in that quote because, you know, if, if somebody was sitting next to me over the last 10 years and watching me each night, and, and you know, the, the thing that I take really great pride in, and for people that wouldn't know me, they'd be like, well, he obviously doesn't have a family, and, and that's so far from the truth. I've got four kids, you know? So, um, and if you talk to them, they would tell you that I don't do this stuff when they're awake. I do this stuff when they're sleeping. And, and it's, it's not a lot of sleep. You know, I, I get six or seven hours, but I work very hard when my family or my kids, I should say, because my wife, she's a hard worker too. Real hard worker. She, in fact, she puts me to shame sometimes. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, um, you know, it's it's... It's a habit loop. It's something that is very uh, um, mechanical in nature. Uh, and I've been working at it for a very long period of time. So that's how it's possible. It's so great and it's so admirable. It makes me think of Elizabeth Gilbert wrote a book called uh, Big Magic, which is the art of creative living. And she talks about in the book how inspiration, she views inspiration rewards those who wake up at 5 a.m. And you're, you're waking up even before that, 3 or 4 a.m. And I, I just imagine that to be able to do all of these things, to be a parent of four, to be serving active duty in the military and simultaneously running this this insanely successful podcast, it requires sacrificing things like sleep and getting up early and fitting things into the nooks and crannies of your life. Well, and the thing that, that like now I've got a team that's around me, like, it's not like Preston's out there, like writing code anymore. And like, like, you know, like it's so far from that where early on it was, it was, you know, you're, you're the operations department, you're the finance department, you're the marketing, you're the branding, you're everything when you start, but then you start to have some wins under your belt and you start to realize, hey, I got to hire somebody to do that. Well, how can I do that? And then you start just growing the team and, and getting really good people that are working with you as a team. 
And then, like now, I mean, I sleep very well. I get a lot of hours of sleep, believe it or not, with all everything that's going on. I'm, I'm able to manage it, but it's because I've got such an incredible team around me, which takes just a ton of time to find those right people. But when you find them, you compensate them way better than they should be compensated so that they never leave, you know? That's awesome that you're finally getting some sleep after uh, a, a ton of time out of balance there. And one of the things I wanted to ask about is your history with writing. And it looks like it started when you were at West Point and it's continued to today where you've published a lot of extremely successful books. I'm curious what advice you have to listeners who aspire to write their own book, as well as just um, more information about where this whole passion came from for you. Well, I'll tell you, (laughs) and I think people would hear this and they wouldn't even believe it, but when I was at West Point, my absolutely Achilles heel, absolute worst subject was English and writing. Okay. Hands down, not even a a shadow of a doubt. In fact, if you, if you know any of my friends I went to West Point with and you ask them, you know, Preston's going to write a book someday, they would look at you and, and tell you there is no way in, you know, in hell that that's ever going to happen because I just wasn't, a I, I, it's just not something I practiced. It wasn't something that I did. And so um, I, I kind of saw it later on. In fact, when I was a, when, in my junior year at West Point, they had, I don't think they have it anymore, but back then they had a writing test that you had to pass. And if you didn't pass this, they literally threw you out of the school. I know this sounds unbelievable. Like it, there's no way that's possible, but it's possible. They, they literally had this test. If you didn't pass it going into your junior year, you got thrown out of the school. You got two tries. The very first time I took it, I failed. I had to take it for the second time. And it was like, everything was riding on this second writing. And I think that they just let me skate through it and, and, and pass it. <laughs> but, um, the reason I say that is because later I was in, I was in the army. I was, uh, I was in Afghanistan at the time. And in Afghanistan, there's downtime, believe it or not, on, especially for the, I was on a larger base. I wasn't on one of these smaller outposts where guys are really, I mean, dug in and, and in the fight. I was a pilot. I was on a division staff. I had a 12 hour on shift and a 12 hour off shift. So on my off shift, I was like, Hey, I can sit around watching movies or just kind of wasting my time, or I can try to improve myself and try to do something. So I was like, Hey, I'm going to capture some of the funniest moments that happened to me whenever I was at West Point, kind of spin them into a leadership lesson. Each chapter will be one of these funny stories that kind of has like a leadership lesson tied to it. And let me just try to write a book. Like, what the heck? Like, I'm terrible at writing, so let me try to write a book, right? And it was kind of this inverse mindset of I'm bad at this and I want to get good at it. So let me try to just push myself to the limits and write a book. And so... Like like anything, you just kind of start nibbling away at it. And so I was like, well, let me write one chapter. Let me write one funny story and then tie a leadership lesson to it. Give it to somebody to read. And if they find it funny and they enjoy it, then maybe I'll write another one. And so that's what I did. I just, you know, like very minimal risk. You know, they might look at me like an idiot, but I, I did it. The first person read it. They said, that was absolutely hilarious. Like, you need to write another one. And so I did. And I just kind of turned into this little after work kind of activity where I just kind of nugged away at it. I had a whole year over there, you know, so it was like, that was, that was what I did. And I just kind of knocked out a book and it kind of got me going, you know? That's awesome. And it's so much more refreshing to hear that than I thought maybe, you know, you had always been this prolific writer and the fact that you weren't good at writing that you used your spare time to improve on this skill set and got to the point where you were successful at it, I think to me is so much more encouraging for listeners who may put off a career choice or even a hobby because they think that it's too late or they think that they're not qualified or they're not good at it. I hope listeners take heart that, you know, hearing your story of coming from nothing to being this this published author, that they can pursue things like that as well. What about the Investors Podcast? Where did this come from? So this started off, so I had just loved investing. I loved finance and most of it stemmed from, so I did, I did aerospace engineering when I was at West Point. I liked math. Like that's just, that was my niche. 
And so after I got out, you go into the army and you're doing army like things. I, I went to flight school and started doing that kind of stuff. And, um, you're not really using any of that stuff that you learned in your undergrad. So I wasn't using math. I wasn't doing engineering type work. And so it was like, well, where can I scratch this itch? And for me, it, it was in the finance sector and in investing. And so I was, uh, I asked myself, I try to, I try to ask myself simple questions. So for me, it was like, okay, well, I want to learn about investing. I want to, I want to be great at this. Um, so who is the absolute best investor in the world and how did they learn what they know? That was the simple question I asked myself. And so I didn't know, you know, I just started searching around. I was like, okay, well, that's Warren Buffett. He's, he's got the, at the time he had the highest net worth in the world and he was, you know, known for being a stock investor. So I said, okay, well, how did he learn what he knows? Who were his mentors? What books did he read? And so I started digging into not trying to understand Warren Buffett, but actually what resources did Warren Buffett say made him who he is. And so then I just started reading every one of those resources until I felt like I, I understood who he was. So I did this and I felt like, I don't know, I when I was going through the process, I guess my frustration was, one of, one of his favorite books is a book called Security Analysis. So I buy Security Analysis, I start going through this book. And it's just insanely difficult if you don't have a background in finance, which I didn't have. And so I'm reading this book. Well, let me rephrase that. I'm, I'm flipping through this book and I guess reading it, but not understanding anything that I'm reading. And I was like, okay, well, I can't understand the terminology. It's almost like reading a foreign language. It's like getting a book in French and you don't speak any French. That's what it was like for me when I was reading this book, Security Analysis. So I, uh, I say, well, I got to understand the terminology. I got to get the French dictionary so I can understand what in the world this book is saying. So then I start digging into accounting and I start digging into all these things that led up to the point where I could actually understand what was in Security Analysis. In fact, I ended up writing a summary book on security analysis so that other people like me that were out there who can't, who crack it open for the first time and just cannot get through it. I tried to write a book that bridged that gap that helped them bridge that gap to being able to read it and understand it. But anyway, long story short, I, I feel like I go down this path and I feel like so many people that write in this space write for their ego instead of their audience. And that was a frustration for me. I was like, this stuff is not difficult. It's just the terminology and there, there's multiple terms that mean the same thing. If I say sales and I say revenue, that's both the top line of an income statement. But for a person who would hear that, they'd be like, huh, what? So um, I wanted to write a book that made it simple to understand, but got to the essence of Buffett's investing approach. So, you know, I, I wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> and the the other thing too, I you know there's a there's so much luck in some of my timing too. So whenever I wrote this book, this is when print on demand was just becoming a thing. It wasn't something that a lot of people even understood or even knew was out there. Where you can basically write a book, you can put it in a digital format, you can set it up for drop shipping. A uh, book manufacturer called Lightning Source, which is a uh, 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 subsidiary of, um, I think it's Boker, uh, who's the Ingram books, I'm sorry, of Ingram books. So they'll, they'll take that digital file. If they get a, if they get a, uh, order from Amazon, they print it that day and they immediately ship it in the Amazon packaging straight out of the factory. And then they mail me a royalty check. So this is like stuff that was never possible in the past. That was all kind of just happening right as I was kind of going through this phase where I was writing this book. And this is, I guess, I don't know, eight, nine years ago, right? And so this is the other thing that was happening eight, nine years ago is YouTube was this new thing, right? Like it wasn't something that was really, people were just learning about it. And so I knew a little bit about HTML and CSS programming. And I was, I was just like, hey, I could, I could take these lessons that I just wrote for this book. I could record some YouTube videos like post them online and then just take the hyperlinks and embed them into the Kindle version of this book on Amazon. And, and then people can not only read it, but then they can listen to me kind of explain the lesson 
after I'm done. And so this was like, this was, nobody was doing this. This was just like, my timing was impeccable, right? And so I published the Kindle version. I published the, the hard copy of the book. And I think because it was so different and it had these links and it had these videos and it led the, the Kindle book led to tools like online tools that help you calculate intrinsic values of businesses and all this other stuff it was just different. And, and so the book took off and it did well. And one thing led to another, you know. What about your co-founder? How was it that you found the, the person that you run We Study Billionaires with? So I was at the, the Berkshire Hathaway shareholders meeting in Omaha, Nebraska. And just for anybody that's ever been out to this thing or haven't been out to this thing, um, just all, I, I can't begin to tell you the type of person that goes to this thing. It is just really unique people, people with just the craziest backgrounds. You just can't even imagine some of the stories that you hear from random people of just like, Oh Yeah. So I'm standing in the airport, leaving Omaha. We just went to the shareholders meeting and I see a guy standing there and he's wearing a LinkedIn jacket. And this is when LinkedIn was just becoming like a really big thing. And so I say to the guy, hey, you work for LinkedIn? He goes, yeah, I'm one of the executive programmers for LinkedIn. And so we just started chatting and he's like a hardcore Warren Buffett fan, a shareholder, you know, and so we, we start talking and. And uh, he says, yeah, so uh, do you ever listen to this, to podcasts? And I said, I have no idea what that even is. And he says, oh, it's like, it's like on-demand radio. It's like the, it's going to be like radio in the future. And I says, oh, really? He says, you need to listen to this guy. And he gave me this guy's podcast. Uh, you might have heard of him, uh, Pat Flynn. And he says, you need to listen to this guy's podcast because at the time I was building the Buffett's Books website. And he's like, yeah, you need to check this out. And so... You know, I got on the plane, I downloaded this podcast and I listened to it and I said, holy crap, this guy is doing radio right over, you know, a smartphone and all he's doing is uploading discussions onto a server that people can just download straight into their, their device, right? And he's like, this is crazy. This is, this, and what I was really thinking was, because I just did all these, these YouTube videos, I was thinking, holy crap, I don't have to spend all this time making video. <laughs> You know, like I could, I could just have a conversation and publish it and not have to, cause I'll tell you, it's crazy. The amount of time it takes to do a video versus a podcast. It's just in a different stratosphere of, of work and time and editing and everything else. So I was just like, this is awesome. And, you know, I later met Stig on a forum that I stood up where we're talking about investing picks. This guy shows up, he starts writing these like dissertations on oil companies and I'm like who the who the heck is this guy and you know it turns out he went to Harvard and he's like super smart and we were just having really nerdy conversations and I was trying to write another book at the time a, an accounting book and I was having I was running into, into time constraints and so I said to Stig I said hey man I know you don't I know we really don't even know each other but I'm working on this book you're super smart like we have a lot of similar ways of thinking about investing. Would you like to help me finish the book and then we'll co-author it? And he writes me back and he's just like, you know, we had never even seen each other, talked on the phone or anything. It was just straight like geeked out form style, like, you know, like 2003 form. <laughs> and, and he's just like, absolutely, let's do it. And so we published the, the next book together and, and that one went on and did well as well. That's so incredible because when I put myself in your shoes, I think, man, I've been toiling away at this book. I'm halfway through it. There is no way in hell that I'm going to share the credit with someone else. Like I just am so territorial. Like I can't see myself doing that. But what I love about this is it seems like you saw this guy. You didn't really know him. You had some sort of intuition and you're willing to share something. You're willing to essentially split it 50-50. And out of that came this great this great relationship and this foundation for everything else that came afterwards. And I just admire that because I can think of myself operating with this scarcity mindset and not really making allowance to take that risk to just put myself out there and be willing to take, you know, take a very big risk in working with someone. 
Well, I love that point because I'll, I'll tell you right now, there's no way that over the past 10 years I could possibly have done even 10% of what I've been able to do on the side uh, without giving up big portions of equity. of and, and not necessarily from like a business standpoint, but from an asset standpoint. So like you got all these, you got all these assets, like, I mean, I'll just, I'll just be honest with you. What we're recording right now for you is an asset. Like this thing's going to continue to run into perpetuity. You can run advertising on it or however you monetize this asset. This discussion is an asset. Okay. And so what I would tell you is when you create more and more and more assets in the future, um, for people that are listening to this, every time you create something, if you can, if you can make your life a little simpler and save yourself a little time because you give up some of the equity for that specific asset, then do it. Just it's it's not about. Um, I think you, you just find out that you get so much further by not pinching every penny and worrying about your cut and just doing some deals and just moving out and moving on to the next thing and just keep moving forward and keep building and and more, most importantly aligning yourself with great people. Like it's so much more important for me to do a deal with somebody that I like and somebody that I can trust and somebody who's not going to be a penny pincher in the future and just like and and just work with them. Like that relationship to me is way more valuable than the than whatever the thing's going to do. That's great. And you know, I just imagine that you you've bought more lottery tickets. Like you put yourself out there. You take these risks that I view as kind of big risks. And maybe, let's say in an alternate world, maybe this wasn't the right partner. Maybe you give up half of this book and this person doesn't work out. Great, you learn that lesson. But over time, it's, it's like game theory. Over time, as you put yourself out there and put yourself out there, eventually you're going to find someone who is giving like you, who is a good partner. And that, like you said, that's going to lead to something far greater than the sum of its parts. If you're working with a giver, okay, and this is, if you're gonna pick a partner, you got to pick, if you're a giver and the other person is not, I would argue in the long term that relationship is going to fail, just like a marriage will fail. Like if you have a husband that's giving or a wife that's giving and the other one's just kind of a taker, they're just sitting on the couch and the other person's doing all the dishes and all that kind of stuff, like it's not going to, it's not going to last because in the end, the, the one side recognizes that it's not a sharing relationship and it just fails, right? And so how do you know that you're going to get in that relationship with a business partner before you get into that business? I would I would you know, and this is this is probably a very pessimistic vantage point, but I tell you a very large chunk of that is just pure flipping luck. <laughs> and um and I don't, I don't have like a magic formula or something to tell somebody other than look at, look at how the person gives versus how the person takes. And unfortunately, I, I tell you, most of it's going to be masked anyway. So whatever opinion you come up with, it's probably not going to be all that informative as you make your decision. So, uh, you know, just be lucky. That's awesome. That's awesome. Giving's reciprocal. So like if I walk in a door... And I open the door. Let's just say there's like the, uh, you know, where they there's like two sets of doors when you walk into like a corporate building. Like if, if you and I are walking in and I walk in before you and I open the door for you and you walk into that first section and then the next set of doors come, what do you typically do? You open, yeah, you open the door for me and then I walk through and, be, and because I opened the door and gave that to you, I actually entered the building first. Because you opened the door for me and then I walked in. Um, and I and we walked through the building together with this relationship of trust in each other and gratitude for each other. And then that's reciprocal to everybody else that we interact with after that engagement. And so I, what I think a lot of people fail to recognize is that... Um, and, and I think the, the reason why a lot of people fail to to believe in this idea of reciprocation when you give is because it's not a guarantee. But I would argue that if you do it in large numbers, you'll find, at least I believe, that the universe has to find a way to 
equalize and balance itself out. And so by when a person gives in mass quantity and they do it and they do it and they do it, I think that it's very easy for them to see the power of it because they're seeing it at scale. Where a person who just has random engagements on a given day, they only give here and there and their day is is very... Um, it's it's not at scale. It's not dealing with a hundred thousand people. It's dealing with you know onesies and twosies. It's very hard for them to to believe in the concept because it's it's expressing itself in a volatile way back into their life. What about for people running a podcast, myself included? What advice do you have about growing an audience? And it could be for a podcast or uh, a blog, a book, a product, whatever it is. How how have you so successfully grown the audience for We Study Billionaires? I mean, first and foremost, like anything, when you're designing a product, you're designing a service, like your very first thing you need to focus on is the quality of whatever it is you're delivering. So like Stig and I are relentless on our editing of our show. There is nothing for me more frustrating. And I really don't, honestly, I don't listen to a lot of podcasts. Uh, I, I really don't listen to podcasts. I, I listen to audio books and I do book, I'm, I'm the bookworm. So, um, but the few podcasts that I have kind of turned on, I'm, I'm always just kind of rolling my eyes and kind of amazed at the lack of, ed- of editing that takes place where people are just, they're just talking the talk and there's no content. There's nothing that the person walks away with and says, I just learned something right there that was extremely valuable or I, I need to write that down. Like there's, those moments are so far and f- few between And so what I would tell you is it's way more valuable to publish a 10 minute interview where it's just straight value the whole time than to publish something that's an hour and a half long. And there's like one nugget that was found at minute 47. That's great because I think um, there's a lot of schools of thought out there about just producing a tremendous volume of content and less of an emphasis on quality. And I'm wondering, because you've had some incredible guests on your show, when it comes to filtering out content, when it comes to editing or making that content briefer, how do you decide what to keep and what to to let go of? Uh, You know, it really depends on the guest. Um, some of the guests you come, like, I mean, we had Tony Robbins on the show. Like there, there, I mean, you're not editing much that, I mean, he's just, he's just spitting hot fire. You know, I mean, the guy is just, he's incredible. Um, and you have other people that come on the show and they say things and I'll be honest with you. We edit ourselves a lot because, um, you know, I'm on the show every week. So there's some things that I say over you know and I don't realize that I'm saying it because I've been doing the show so long you don't remember some of the things you say but I think it's I think it's really important to try to whittle yourself down and especially highlight your guest and then showcase them and then get their really important nuggets that they're pumping out that to to go back to your to your original question about growing kind of the audience I think it's also really important for people to understand their market so like your show you you're you're catering to a niche I'm catering to an investing niche. So if you're just going to look at it from a pure numbers standpoint, like how, how large is that audience? How many people out there want to listen to a business podcast or a stock investing podcast or a military uh, podcast or whatever the, whatever it is. And I learned this in the publishing industry because, you know, I, the, my first book I wrote was about West Point. And so like, what's the market size for, for a West Point book? Well, I would argue it's pretty much like everyone applying for that freshman class, the upcoming freshman. They're like that's your market size, and for a book, that's not a big market size, especially when you're comparing it to an investing book, which is a way bigger market size. So a podcast is is really similar. So you got to understand what those numbers are. Then you also have to understand how many competitors are in that space. So if I've if I've got two competitors in the investing space, well. Even if you suck, you're probably going to have a pretty big population of people listening to your show just by the the, the mathematics of of the audience and the the competition and that kind of stuff. And then you also have to account for the growth rate of the of the listeners and the growth rate of the competition. So when you account for that stuff, and and the reason I say this is because so many people are like, hey. My barrier to entry to do a podcast is a computer, which I already own, 
and a microphone which is already built into the computer and a $20 subscription to host the audio file. Okay, so like, like your barrier to entry is nothing. So how in the world are you gonna sell that? And what I would tell you the last thing when it comes to this is you gotta, you gotta be really good at search engine optimization. You gotta understand how that works. I would argue that that's, um, if, you, if you would look at a brick and mortar analogy of a business, you know, they say location, location, location. If you plop your hot dog stand down on the busiest street where there's an intersection and there's just cars, you know, in a line, just can't go through that intersection any faster. You can have the world's worst hot dog, but you're going to sell a million of them just because of the sheer traffic that's going by your store. And on the internet, that's called search engine optimization. So if you can, if you can drive traffic past your shows and you understand how to do that, you can be marginal at what you do. And if you have that traffic pattern in place and you're not paying for that traffic pattern, you're going to do pretty darn well. But you got to understand how that works. That's great. I mean, it's great for people who are doing publishing or podcasting. It's great for people who are in entrepreneurship or just any career path thinking of uh, what is the market size here? What is the bigger opportunity? Is there a big enough lane here for me to carve out a career or the next couple of years? And that seems to, to make such a big difference. What are some of the trends that you've seen in studying billionaires? Like what themes have you found? Ooh, so <laughs> I could, I mean, I could turn this into a two hour discussion um, with some of the, the things that I've learned. And I would, I would tell you the most fruitful thing from anything I've done in the last, you know, 10 years have been these discussions with these people that have been shaped and molded by insanely successful people that have shared their secrets, you know, with, with them. So I would tell you, I'm just going to name a couple here of what I've learned from these various people. And I might go a little long. So if I go long, just interrupt me and tell me to, that, we're, that we're going to move on to the next question. So uh, Tony Robbins. So the, a little history on Tony Robbins. So Tony Robbins basically got his, I would, I would tell you he got his foundation from a guy named Jim Rowan. And if you want to read some just amazing books open up some Jim Rowan books and open up some early Tony Robbins books where he talks about some of these ideas. So Tony Robbins is all about setting the destination. Where in the H are you going? Okay. Because, and, and Jim Rowan, I think uses this analogy more, but I've, I think Tony also kind of uses it. Imagine yourself, you're on a boat. Okay. You're on the boat by yourself. You're on a sailboat and you want to go somewhere. You want to go to a destination. Well, the only way that you're actually going to go there is you have to first identify what in the world it is you're trying to achieve. Where am I going? And so if you're trying to start your own business, if you're trying to, what is the destination? What in the world is it that you're trying to achieve? If you, and you don't have to know exactly where you're going. You just got to kind of know I'm going at an azimuth of zero one zero or whatever. Just get going in kind of the right direction of, of what it is you're trying to achieve. After you do that, you have to have a positive attitude, okay? Because if you're on a boat, okay, sailboat, and let's say we're going, our destination's to the north, but we have a bit of an issue. The wind's blowing directly in our face. The wind's blowing to the south, and our destination is to the north. And if you're starting a business for the first time, I, I'm pretty much assuring you that this is what the pattern is going to look like. You're trying to go north, the wind's blowing to the south, and you're going to look at this and you're going to say, this is impossible. Impossible. But if you know anything about sailing, which I don't because I went to Army, I'm not a Navy guy, um, you can tack into the wind, right? You can, you can go to one side and then you can flip the sail and you can go to the other side and you can go to the other and you can work yourself. You can actually sail straight into the wind that's blowing the opposite way of where you need to go. But the only way you would figure that out is if you approach the problem with a positive mindset that this can be solved. Okay, that's the only way you would solve that if you knew nothing about sailing is you, you would sit there and say, this can be done. I know this seems impossible. I can do this. Let me figure it out. Let me tinker with the controls. So what do, what is it that I control? Do I control the wind? No, I don't control the wind. But I do control this sail and I do control this rudder. And if I control those, maybe I can figure out what the hell I need to do. Okay? 
So this is this analogy that I'm describing here. This is a Jim Rowan and a Tony Robbins analogy. And so then at the end of it, it's be grateful for what you have. It's about the, it's about figuring it out that this is all that's that's what the journey is all about. Which leads me to the next person I want to mention. So the next person that I had the pleasure of not only having on the show but getting to know because um, he's just he's just a great guy. Uh, his name is Jesse Itzler. Jesse is the founder, and maybe people have heard of him. He wrote a book uh, called Living with a Seal. <laughs> See, so you were laughing your tail off. So, uh, the, I mean, what a book. You want to read something that is, is high quality, hilarious. Uh, you know, Jesse hired a Navy SEAL to live with him for 30 Not just the Navy SEAL, but like pr- probably the craziest dude on the, on the flipping planet. Anyway, so I have, I, I meet a friend, this goes back, so I'm out in Omaha, I have a friend, she's like, you got to meet Jesse Itzler, you guys are so similar, it's ridiculous, and she said he, he sold uh, net jets to Warren Buffett, and he's married to Sarah Blakely, who's, you know, the youngest self-made female billionaire in, in the world, uh, she created Spanx, but anyway, so Jesse, we bring Jesse on the show, Jesse and I hit it off, and he invites me to go to, so Jesse starts this, Jesse's like, I want to climb Mount Everest, but it's super dangerous and I have kids. And so I don't want to kill myself, but I want to do it. So he's like, so what I'm going to, I'm just going to rent a mountain and I'm going to like have a bunch of people come there and we're going to just like climb this thing until we achieve 29,000 feet. We're just going to, we're just going to keep climbing this mountain until we get 29,000 feet. So he invites me out to do this. I do this crazy Everest climb with Jesse and um, just to, just have a great relationship with him. Him and, him and Sarah are owners of the Atlanta Hawks. They're just incredible people. So I'm talking to Jesse and I say to Jesse, I said, you know, it's just, you, you, gotta, you gotta love what you do. You gotta love what you do. You gotta be passionate about what you do. And he looked over at me, just stone cold, and he goes, F that. <laughs> and I just kind of smiled and I was like, I, I was looking at him like, dude, I live by that. I like, you know, you gotta you gotta love what you do. And he says, F that, dude. He's like, you gotta love the journey. He's like, you have got to love the journey of the struggle. And I was just like, He's like, look what we're doing right now. We're climbing up this mountain 17 times. He's like, you got to love the pain. You got to love every step. Like, it's not about when we're done and we and we hold up the flag that said we went 29,000 feet because that you're going to feel pretty small like 10 seconds after you achieve that. He's like, it's about right now, man. It's about right now. And so that just, for me, was... Uh, it, it was just kind of a, a really amazing moment from a guy, I mean, from a, literally a billionaire, him and his wife. I mean, it's just, it's just very humbling to, to kind of hear that from somebody who's, who's done it. Well, one, one thing I'm thinking of is you have had a side hustle that is insanely successful. And I don't know how to put this, but it's like, why... Uh, what keeps you in uniform? I could see, I think myself in that situation, I'd be like, peace out guys, I'm going on and doing this full time and putting everything in this. Uh, What causes you to to continue to serve in uniform? So I'm a firm believer. And you know, you go to Afghanistan a couple times and you see what other parts of the world look like. And not not everywhere else in the world is like Afghanistan. I, I understand that. But I, but there's, there's things here in this country that, People just, I, 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 I don't take for granted. And um, I'll talk about myself. I don't take them for granted. I'm just insanely grateful for the opportunities that I've been given. Um, and just so thankful. And, and I look at things like, you know, China. Let's, let, let's just bring that up for an example. Like, hey, yeah, they, they got a boom in economy. They got all these great things, but... Their government is controlling what it is that they see, what they know, what they're what they're allowing into their brain. There's no filter here. And there's people that hate that and there's people that love it. And I'm one of those people that love it. 
and want to do whatever I can to protect that, that freedom of being able to know truth, to question truth. In fact, um, I would argue there's, there's a little bit of pride in questioning the truth and in, in questioning authority and all these things that um, I just, it's invaluable. You go and read history and you look at, at all these different points in time where this was not something that humanity had or enjoyed. And I don't take it for granted one second and I want to do everything I can in order to ensure that it continues to uh, persist. I think that's awesome. I think that's a message that will resonate with listeners. And I think it's really admirable. I, I think it must be hard to maintain that focus. And I'm, I'm curious for people who are on active duty, what advice do you have for them about having something on the side, about having some sort of side hustle? Well, I'll tell you this. Uh, there's nothing more important to me than my job and my service. First, right? Like if if a podcast comes up or I've got to get something done in my line of duty, my line of duty wins every single time, no matter what. Um, so if a person's wanting to do something else, if you want to write a book, if you want to do something, I would tell you, do something that you control the time to. So like if I, if something came up, I don't have to do this interview. I can reschedule it. I can, I can do whatever. And at any time I do something that involves me trying to create an asset, it always starts with, is it something that I have to do or is it something that I can choose to do? And so for, for my business, it's always been something that is a choice at any given moment or can be rescheduled or is not reliant on me being uh, reliable. And I think that that's a really important thing for people if they do want to have a side hustle is that they, they don't neglect their job or their duty first. And I think you could talk to anybody that I have served with and they will absolutely vouch for the fact that that I put my my duties to my service way before anything else. Um, and that's really important to me that, that other people would do the same. That's great. I, I recently had on the uh, the show Billy Hurley, who's a professional PGA golfer, and it, it, it reminds me of what he had said, where when he was on active duty, that was his job, and he focused on that. And what I love about that is this thought that excellence and focus and determination is transferable, that it's not wasted, even though so much of what you do on active duty does not apply to this side job, you're still focused there, you're still giving it your all, and I think that's that's really awesome. I always like to ask guests about resources that could be books, podcasts, anything, especially for those who are deployed or overseas that they could get their hands on today to help in their career. Any recommendations? So, um, big on books. Um, you know, <laughs> that's, that's my thing is, is, and really big on audiobooks because I've got drives, I've got flights and I mean, you just can't imagine how many books you can knock out in a year by feeling points of your of your day where that are just dead space and you can kind of turn your car into a learning laboratory you can turn a you know a flight into that or whatever so with that said I'll, I'll tell you three books that i think are really profound really really at the top of my list um i don't know how many i've read and and i think this is also important a lot of the books that i read are books that that this billionaire said was the most important book they ever read in their life. I'm not just taking like random book recommendations. The books that I read are hyper focused on people that have recommended. I pay very close attention to the source that says this book is important. So here's a couple that I've found through the years that I think are good. The first one is a book called The Power of Habit. Um, the reason I think that this book is so profound is because it gets into this idea of what is it that your subconscious is doing in your brain when you are on autopilot and i think a lot of people don't realize how often their brain is on autopilot and what in the world is it doing and what is it working on um and so the, this book the power of habit is how can you take things that will make you very successful and how can you program your day so that you that you're doing more of the things that add tremendous value for very little effort and how can you eliminate things that require a ton of time and a ton of effort that, that add very little value? And so how do you optimize the one and how do you limit the other? And that book will absolutely give you great ideas on how you can do that and how you can manage a lot of your subconscious behaviors. 
Um, the next one I'd tell you, uh, this book, I just felt like I saw the world from a different vantage point after I read this book. In fact, uh, Charlie Munger, who's Warren Buffett's vice president of Berkshire Hathaway, said that this was his favorite book. And he actually mailed the author, uh, Robert Cialdini. Uh, we've had Robert on the show, and he goes out to Omaha as well. But um, he actually mailed uh, Robert... He's actually mailed a couple of shares of Berkshire stock, which, you know, they're worth a couple hundred thousand bucks. He mailed uh, some Berkshire stock to Robert Cialdini after he read this book. And he says, your book has helped us make hundreds of millions of dollars. And this is my way of saying thanks. And so the book Influence is all about how your brain kind of interprets and does things that are just kind of automatic responses uh, it's very good for people that are interested in marketing, but you just kind of view things a little bit differently after this book. The last one I'd tell you is Warren Buffett's top book. Um, and this is a book called How to Win Friends and Influence People. And I would argue that I think a lot of people coming out of the military and they transition into the civilian sector, um, they come with some amazing skills. They come with skills of get or done. They come with skills of obeying orders and listening and uh, you know, just plowing through things to get things done. But sometimes they come with a little bit like rough edges and are um, very gritty, which is a great thing. But if you can turn that into more finesse, um, I would argue that you're going to have way more success on the outside after you leave uh, military service. And so I think this book, How to Win Friends and Influence People by uh, Dale Carnegie, is at the top of the list. I mean, this is just an incredible book. Those are fantastic recommendations. And for listeners at beyondtheuniform.org, in the show notes for this episode, you'll find links to all of those uh, books. So you don't have to write them down if you're flying a plane or swimming underwater or doing demolition or whatever you're doing right now. Well, I always like to leave the last question open-ended and Preston, I just want to ask what else would you want listeners to know? What are some final words of wisdom that you'd like to leave them with? So, uh, you know, our show is we study billionaires and I think a lot of people might think, Oh, this guy's has a desire to be super rich or whatever. Okay. But I'll tell you, the thing that I've really learned from doing the show and learning all these amazing things from these people that are on a completely different level of success, it, it comes down to a quote from a guy, his name is Ray Dalio. He's a uh, super famous uh, hedge fund manager, runs the biggest hedge fund on the planet. Um, it's called Bridgewater Associates. And Ray has a quote, and Ray, Ray's quote goes like this. You can have anything you want but you can't have everything you want. And what he's getting at is if you truly want something bad enough, you're going to figure out a way to get it done. You're going to figure out a way to achieve it. But what you might not be accounting for or calculating for with that desire is all the, the costs associated with, with achieving it. So the cost might be that you give up your family. The cost might be that you know, you don't even have friends anymore because you're working 20 hours a day. The cost might be you name it. And so what I found is that many of these billionaires are imbalanced in their desire for wealth, for their desire for achievement. And um, I would tell you that you, that the goal, going back to the sailboat example, you're setting the destination. But a lot of the times the destination isn't just like one point. It's not, I'm going to build a $10 million business. Okay. Somebody might set that goal. But I would argue that a smarter goal is something like, I'm going to build a $10 million business, but I'm not going to do it while compromising my family or whatever else you got to slap on there of, of what it is. And you got to achieve all of those things to call it success. And so if one thing gets in the way of the other, you have to maybe adjust that destination of where you're trying to go so that you can achieve all of it and not just one of it. So again, the quote is, you can have anything you want, but you can't have everything you want. And that's probably the most important thing I've learned from studying all these different people. That's awesome. Well, Preston, you are fantastic. I really appreciate your time given all that you're doing and juggling. I appreciate your making time to share your advice with the Beyond the Uniform audience. 
I thoroughly enjoyed this, and thank you for having me on the show. I really appreciated this opportunity. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Quick couple admin points. Um, We release brand new episodes every single Monday and Thursday. Those are usually recorded uh, about a month or so before they go live. Um, And um, every Monday and Thursday, we have an interview, usually almost always with a military veteran about their civilian career. More and more, we're starting to add in experts who may not be veterans, but may have some expertise that will help the military veteran community. Um, Saturdays, I typically post more of a behind the scenes episode, which is a free form format. I try to use what I'm calling a mullet format. And by that, I mean business up front, party in the back, uh, talking through admin points, uh, professional topics related to the podcast. It might be a conversation I had that week. It might have been an interview I had that week, but just trying to, to share things that are top of mind that may help you in more of a free form, straight from the heart format. And then the party in the back is the personal side of things, just kind of more free flowing uh, thoughts on life, on um, uh, improving oneself, just kind of whatever's going on in life and trying to be authentic and um, honest about. Um, those things as well. Special thanks. We have an all volunteer army of people behind Beyond the Uniform making this possible. Uh, We do this on our lunch breaks, on our evenings, on our weekends, because we love the military community. We want to give back. We want to make a difference. We want that as part of the purpose in our life that we we valued in the military. Um, So special thanks to Steve Bain. Steve does pretty much everything. He helps uh, secure guests. He does our newsletter. He keeps the reels rolling and keeps me sane. Kathleen Dillon, the first person to join our team. She writes text transcripts of every single episode. It's wild. She keeps up with two of these a week despite a demanding career and education right now. Uh, But those transcripts help us get more SEO value, helps her audience more. Um, Andrew Woolridge is our data guru. He helps us understand the numbers, which is the easiest way for us to figure out how we can better support you and um, adds kind of the, the data oversight for that. Rick Healy does all of our social media. He is gaining more and more of an audience for us by getting our videos, getting our podcasts out on social channels. Um, the best way to stay in contact with us is if you go to beyondtheuniform.org, there is a newsletter You'll have a little pop-up that comes up. You can put your email in. We email twice per month. We try to be respectful, but it is a great way to get uh, appraised of upcoming events, upcoming interviews, promos, where companies are giving discounts to Beyond the Uniform listeners, and more. Uh, This does cost money to put on. We are um, uh, committed to not charging veterans directly, um, and the way that we kind of offset costs is through corporate sponsors. So if you know of a company that would like to get in front of a military audience and their families, uh, that's one way that we can both add value to our members but also offset the costs of Beyond the Uniform and give us a little bit of budget to start expanding what we're doing. So that's the, the best way you can help us. If that's not something that you can do, a positive review on iTunes is greatly appreciated. Have a wonderful week. We will be back Monday, Thursday, and Saturday with more interviews. And uh, yeah, keep up the, the, the listening. Take care.